The Detroit Regional Chamber's MPC 20 Conversations Respond and Rebuild Digital Series is provided in partnership with Detroit Public Television and presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan with additional support from Accenture, Bank of America, Barton Mallow, Comerica Bank, Consumers Energy, Delta Dental, Dow, DTE Energy, Enbridge Energy, Ford Motor Company, Huntington Bank, ITC, KPMG, the Kresge Foundation, Kroger, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, PNC Bank, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the Skillman Foundation, and TCF Bank. And by these supporters. Support for Detroit Public TV's coverage is provided by DTE Energy Foundation and MASCO. With a bang, energy and change came to every part of our universe. Seismic or small, it continues. Change is all around us. Shaped by technology and human ingenuity. We can make it work for you and your business. Hello and welcome to MPC 20 Conversations, Respond and Rebuild. This digital series hosted by the Detroit Regional Chamber, is bringing smart dialogue focused on the unprecedented challenges that Michiganders are facing today. On behalf of the Chamber, I would like to thank Detroit Public Television and the many longtime corporate and philanthropic partners for bringing the spirit of our annual Mackinac Policy Conference to us virtually throughout the fall. Without their support of the Chamber, these discussions would not be possible. While an in-person Mackinac Policy Conference was not possible this year, ongoing dialogue among business, government, and civic leaders focused on moving Michigan forward remains critical as we work together to rebuild our economy. I hope you enjoy today's discussion and thank you for tuning in. Hi there, I'm Christy McDonald, anchor on One Detroit, on Detroit Public Television. Thanks so much for joining me. It's great to connect with the Detroit Regional Chamber as we continue the Mackinac Policy Conference conversations throughout the year. What I like about this format is we are able to have these intimate conversations with global leaders, especially at this time with presidential change, a pandemic, the push to address racial equality. It is ripe for disruption. And joining me now is the CEO of Accenture, Julie Sweet. Hi, Julie. Hi, Christy. It's great to see you. Thanks. No, it's great to be able to have this opportunity to participate and uh, have this conversation. So thank you. You know, before we tackle all of the various things that you've had to address as the CEO of Accenture, going back only starting in September of 2019, um, I'd like for the audience to get to know you a little bit better. And, and usually when I have the opportunity to speak with CEOs, so many people ask me, say, how did they get to where they are now? And I know that that might be a long answer, but kind of give us a sense of some of the paths you had to decide to take, maybe even starting back in your teen years that established those key moments to, to kind of get where you are now. Uh, well, thanks. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I think of my life as moments, right? Because I think when we all look back, there's a lot that we forget, but we remember those like key decision points. And so I'll share three really important moments for me. Uh, one was when I was graduating from uh, high school and uh, I had won a scholarship and I went to the dinner. And I remember the dinner because it was the first time that my family and I had gone to a restaurant where it had more than two forks. And it was <laughs> fancy. And I remember my dad, My I grew up very modestly. My dad painted cars for a living. My mother graduated from college, actually my freshman year in college. And my dad just said, just watch what everybody does, right? So uh, at that at that night, um, I sat next to a gentleman who it turns out was on the board of trustees of my college. 
And he asked me what you ask every graduating senior, you know, what are you going to study? And uh, I said, international relations. He said, what language? I said, I studied French, but I found that kind of boring. And he said three words that changed my life. He said, how about Chinese? How about Chinese? This was in 1985 when people didn't study Chinese. And I went home to my parents who didn't have a passport, had never left the country uh, and said, I'm going to go across the world and I'm going to spend a year, my junior year in college, and I'm going to study Chinese in Taiwan and Beijing. And, uh, and that was such an important moment, not simply because it put me down in this incredible path of having lived in China and that, but it was that first moment where you think about seeking help, you know, taking advice and then acting on it. And as I think about my career, you know, I have never been afraid to ask for help and to seek out. And I, I talk about networks, not so much about how to get my next job, but the networks that I've built about how to actually grow as a professional, learn. And so when I came to Accenture and I didn't know anything about technology, I made friends with our head of technology in India. And I spent 18 months meeting with him every two weeks to learn technology. But at the root of that was this willingness to ask for help. And uh, I'd say the second really big moment uh, was the power of learning. So I started my legal career. So I, I went from um, high school to college to law school. And when I first started my law firm, I got in my first class, I realized I didn't know anything about business. And here I was going to be a commercial lawyer. And I knew nothing about numbers. And I went to the business school, uh, live, uh, the, the store at Columbia, and I bought an accounting textbook. And I made friends with every accountant on all of our deals. <laughs> I learned accounting. So yeah. I learned numbers and, and, you know, there's a lot of different things that have influenced me, but being willing to ask for help, being a learner, right. And, and a lot of that, you have to have humility. And that's one of the biggest like leadership characteristics I actually look for in my leaders is the humility to be a learner. And then finally to build great teams. And if you have humility, that's when you ask for help, seek help, build networks of great people. So those are the two critical moments. It may seem small, but actually put me on a path uh, that has helped me achieve uh, you know, being the CEO of an amazing company. No, I, I think that really resonates, resonates this stepping forward without fear, because I think um, when people are coming out of college or, or students are trying to pick the path where they go in life, they're afraid to fail or they're afraid to make that mistake. So therefore, they don't take that leap or they don't say, well, you know what, I am going to study Chinese and I'm going to figure out how to make it happen. Yes, I, I like to talk about fearless, but prepared. Right. Uh, so, you know, you can't be fearless without the willingness to be prepared, you know, to do the learning, to invest in the time, but it's important to have both. All right, so the preparedness definitely came in handy when you looked at March, 2020, you had been the CEO of Accenture. We talked about starting in September of 2019, the pandemic hits in March of 2020. So kind of take us along some of the key decisions that you and your staff had to make to help Accenture adapt in this global change. Sure. And, uh, you know, as I think about my first year, so we have a fiscal year that ends August 31st. So I literally had six months with no COVID and six months with COVID in my first year, uh, which uh, is, you know, sort of a remarkable time we, when I look back at what is probably for all of us, one of the hardest professional years um, in, uh, in, his, in our histories. Uh, but when it, when the COVID happened, it was March, uh, it was just after we finished our second quarter, which was the highest sales quarter in our, um, in our history. And we had earnings uh, nine days, March 19th, right after the pandemic was declared. And of course, no one asked about it, right? What they were prepared about was, you know, how we were going to navigate COVID. And the good news for Accenture is that we have been remote for three decades. So my leadership team, we don't have a headquarters. Uh, this is the first time in three decades that the CEO and the CFO are actually together. And so mm -hmm. for us, the actual operation of our company was really seamless. The focus, however, was quickly on 
our people and our clients. And so how do we actually make sure that our people were being sustained through this? We did have to move a lot of people home that were not working from home. So 90 at the peak, 95% of our 500,000 people were working from home. Uh, so uh, not only getting them there, but more importantly, having them feel comfortable in the new environment. So we did things like create a, a website that everybody could go to that had exercises and tips for how to deal with the stress we introduced um, a new version of Thriving Mind, which we um, uh, we partner with uh, Thrive by Ariana Huffington. We had just put out this program for mental wellness and we adapted it so that people could use it in much shorter bursts. So we focused on our employees. And then the second thing, of course, was seamless service you know, for our clients. And again, we were used to working remotely, but many of our clients were not. And so it was, you know, quickly establishing those relationships and new ways of working and helping our clients do so that really um, preoccupied us for that first uh, several weeks. But then we quickly as a company turned to how will we make sure that we emerge stronger from this crisis? And I share that with you because many, many CEOs I talk to uh, talk about how, you know, the the sort of old adage, never waste a good crisis, we want to emerge stronger. But one of the things mm -hmm. that is really differentiating our clients is those who get real clarity about what that means. So in our case, we established five goals, we measured them. And in fact, when we did our earnings after our fiscal year, we shared those with our investors. And, and I think as companies today, whatever the size, it's really important to have that clarity on what is going to be achieved during this time, which includes the, what you're going to do with your employees, what you're going to do with your clients. So it's not just about numbers, but defining, you know, what does it mean to emerge stronger is really important. And, and I think also balancing that with also the long-term plan. So now you're seeing how you have to change within the crisis that you're dealing with in front of you and how it will change the next four weeks from now, but then how that measures up with what you want to be able to do as a company five years from now. When you look at how some companies, either small or large, are adapting and with tech, did you see that maybe some companies were more prepared? to deal with a, a crisis like this, like a global pandemic than others. And it's really now the great equalizer of what's happening with some companies. Well, I think what um, the way I really think about it is the pandemic occurred during one of the greatest uh, times of change in our history due to the exponential change in technology. So it's a very different kind of crisis because already you were seeing the winners and the losers from who was adapting technology. And there's been so much written about that. And mm -hmm. overnight, the conversation about whether technology uh, was valuable or not and what role kind of went away because technology became the lifeline, right? And that was a big mm -hmm. shift yep. that occurred. But what then happened is that it really mattered, were you a leader pre-COVID in technology or not? Did you have the scale, right? And I take two companies. We have one that we started talking about curbside pickup back in 2016 who hadn't acted. We have another company that was just piloting curbside pickup right before the crisis. And in 48 hours, they were able to roll it out to all of their stores and weathered the crisis much stronger, but they had been investing for years. The other company struggled and wasn't able to um, do so as nearly as rapidly. And, and so what's happened in the crisis is that the chasm between the digital leaders and the laggards has really widened. And that's significant because our research back in 2019, so just a year before the, the crisis, said that those who, the top 10% in terms of digital adoption, leadership, and culture were already performing twice as well as the bottom 25%. And we're now redoing that research and we expect that that will have widened in just the first you know, seven or eight months of, uh, of uh, post, post the pandemic being declared. So when you look at being able to catch up and recovery, I mean, how does a company gain back that ground or what can they do at this point to kind of catch back up? It's a great question. And the good news is that you can catch up. So I'd say there are two really important things you have to do. One is speed. 
right? And one is learning from others. So let me take the speed question. Okay. The great news is that, you know, if you think about large enterprises in particular, almost every industry, no matter where you were, companies and CEOs were rightly proud. People adapted quickly, right? Mm -hmm. to, um, and they figured out a way to get online, et cetera. And many, many CEOs said to me, we move so fast. We've been trying to become digital and look, we all went remote. We wanna keep moving that fast. And there's a very simple uh, question I ask and I say, what have you changed? Because no organization, whether you're big, medium or small can permanently operate in crisis mode. And crisis mode is what allowed many companies to move quickly. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things you have to do is say, how am I going to institutionalize speed? In large companies, that's also often means changing the way you do procurement. It means changing the way you partner. But if you don't make changes that are fundamental in terms of how you're decision making, then more likely than not, you're not going to be able to move fast enough. And if you're behind, right, it's making the decisions and executing much faster than pre-COVID that's going to allow you to actually catch up. And coupled with the second thing, which is being willing to learn from others. What we find is many companies who've gone more slowly are ones that are like, if it's not invented here, I don't want it to- It didn't do happen. Exactly. <laughs> I want to build it myself, right? I want to do that. And so what's great is that we are several years into the digital revolution. And there are solutions and partners and great examples of leaders literally in every industry. And so what we're seeing now is that the companies who are willing to move much faster and they make the changes and who are saying it doesn't have to be built here, right, are, 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 are moving ahead and will be able to catch up. And I guess the last thing is don't ever forget what we live by at Accenture. And many companies and the most successful companies, progress over perfection. Speed means you have to be willing to be uncomfortable that you don't have all of the answers uh, and things aren't perfectly designed. So progress over perfection. Let's talk a little bit about recovery when you look at not only how the U.S. is handling its response to the crisis and also we got the, the news earlier on in the week about a, a potential uh, vaccine for COVID. But when you get together with other CEOs and you have these conversations, what do you see that needs to happen to continue to move recovery forward around the world? And what are other leaders telling you? Well, I'd probably put it in a couple of different um, categories. So at a sort of policy standpoint, uh, really every country in the world um, who's been dealing with this, the CEOs are very focused on the government response, right? Getting the fiscal stimulus that you saw really took the edge off um, the crisis really in all the major markets in the world and managing that uh, appropriately. And so that is a big topic. And, you know, many of us as CEOs are leaning in in whatever market that we're in to, to really look at how to manage that, um, the stimulus and continuing to do it in the right way. Obviously, it's not an unlimited mm -hmm. thing. So on that issue, I think that's top of mind and certainly top of mind in the U.S. where we um, just had an election. And uh, as you know, that was a big discussion beforehand. And so we're all looking to see how that is. The second piece is, uh, of course, you know, how to really manage the recovery from a health perspective, because even though we have good news on the vaccine, we, we all know all the issues with distribution. And, uh, and we know that if we can't get control of the, um, the health effects, both from therapeutics and behavioral changes, uh, really being you know, very clear, like mask wearing, et cetera, that we're going to really have, you know, problems and you can only have so much fiscal stimulus, right? And so mm -hmm. that the really doing, and I think companies have a big part to play here because all of us are, you know, instituting very strong, you know, wearing masks and health protocols. And many of us are trying to really partner with governments to help them understand what we're doing and how they can sort of look to the private sector to help lead the way. And then the final piece is that we need to think about how we're rebuilding because companies are transforming, economies are transforming, entire industries are having to change. And this is the time 
to really be building in the changes that will benefit all um, because there's so much that has to change all at once. And it's a huge opportunity. And many of us are talking about how do we make sure that we capture that opportunity. Um, you did mention, obviously, the presidential election and, and that we've had probably the most tumultuous election cycle in, in modern history. How do you see the change in leadership with uh, Joe Biden as the president-elect affecting the business um, here in the U.S. and around the world? You know, I think it's really too early to tell, uh, you know, and, and the priorities that uh, I think whether, uh, you, know, w w you know, whether you're President Trump or President-elect um, Biden, are really the same. They're the economic recovery and the health um, recovery. And uh, all of us as the private sector leaders are very united around those two priorities. And those have been focus, uh, uh, focus areas, not just for the US, but really we operate globally in every market. Kind of brings me down the road a little bit when we look at the White House and Kamala Harris as the vice president elect making history. You really can't discount the power of um, female leadership and how reflection at the top can improve a workforce. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the work that you're doing at Accenture to advance gender diversity in, in general? Thanks. You know, it's an area uh, that we're really passionate about at Accenture, um, not just for gender, but inclusion and diversity, because mm -hmm. we really believe it's core to our success. And if you look back in our own history, in 2014, we became the first company to create a digital business unit in professional services. And at the same time, we doubled down on our commitment to inclusion and diversity because we felt that in order to become a more innovation-led company, we had to be more diverse. And to give you some sense of it, back then we had about 250,000 uh, people, about 36% women. Today, we are 506,000 and 45% women. And our formula was very clear. Believe that it's a business priority and then set goals with accountable leaders, measure progress and have an execution plan and then be agile. Like if it's not working, you change. And, and so this is the formula and we're doing the same in other areas of diversity. And so as companies, and I know there's, you know, this is an area where I know many, many of the companies we work with in Michigan, we're very proud of our um, business there share those same values. And, uh, and that I think the key is that commitment that it's a business priority and treating it in the same way and progress will happen. Uh, you know, we just got some numbers out that women are leaving the workforce in droves. Um, how do you think that that is because of COVID, because they've felt the need that they need to be home with their children who are, are home from school? How do you think that is going to impact the workforce of the future when we have women who are leaving the workforce right now? Christy, it's really alarming, right? And uh, and it's a big topic of discussion. I know at Accenture, we've done a couple of things that both benefit women and men. But uh, to your point, there is a you know a big risk for many uh, for many women. We've done uh, we have childcare. We partner with Bright Horizons to provide subsidized childcare for supervised learning for children. We've created a platform. Uh, we call it the Village Platform, where because it takes a village uh, that's partnering uh, with it's bringing together people that our employees know to help tutor, for example, their kids uh, and. All of these are just examples of the need in each company to really understand what are the needs of their women uh, and you know what do they have to do now and, and of course there, there are men who need this as well so it's you know it's gender neutral to that perspective but we mm -hmm. do know that this disproportionately is hitting women and here is where I think it's important that we're collaborating together with as a government, uh, and and uh, also uh, companies to share what we're doing, but it fundamentally comes down to understanding the needs of the women in your particular workforce and then how best to meet them. Have you had to do a lot of adjusting since um, since the pandemic to try to help working with your, your families and, and your men and women who are trying to do the best they can, but they find themselves in a totally different circumstance, a working circumstance? You know, absolutely. I mean, some people ask me, like, what are the lasting effects of this crisis? And I think one of the best effects, and I've heard this from many, many companies, is that I think we've all become more human. Uh, we've become more aware of our colleagues. 
uh, just in the same way someone will know if I'm not in the room, the same room, because they all get to know our rooms. But we know, <laughs> have a dog. Do we have children? You know, and and so I think that the crisis is helping us all become better colleagues. And that will help us in the long term. And that allows us to adjust. And we're really careful. Like we're trying to make sure, you know, we, when we started our new fiscal year, we said we're emerging from the crisis. We're turning the page. We're facing a new reality because we did not want to continue to feel like we're waiting for something. But as a part of that, when we talk about having people come back to the office where it's safe, we're very clear. Let's make sure that no one's left behind who you know, can't come into the office because of their personal situation. And the great news is our people know each other's personal situation, right? And so I think that'll be, you know, from an optimistic perspective, you know, a great and lasting effect uh, at all of our companies is the deepening of those relationships and the focus on both personal and professional um, success. Let's get into some Accenture news. You've had a, a pretty busy October from, uh, from what I could see here. You just launched a rebranding campaign for the company. Um, tell us a little bit about the new strategy and, and the timing of it, doing it right now. Yeah, Christy, no, this, uh, this started actually back in September when I became a CEO in 2019. And uh, there were three things we thought were really important. We needed to define our purpose. Our people all felt like they had a purpose, but we couldn't articulate it in a consistent way. And we think it's really important to inform our strategy uh, and to really be able to say, you know, what's our unique role in the world? Uh, we also uh, were completing a strategy we'd been, begun back in 2014 to become a company that uh, was 70% digital uh, cloud and security, and we were going to achieve that, so we needed a new strategy. And we hadn't rebranded in a decade, but it was super important that we start with purpose and then move to strategy, because think of purpose as our North Star, strategy is our action plan, and our brand should reflect both. And so... COVID was um, sort of in the middle of all this and was a great mm -hmm. test of that work. So we launched our purpose, which is to, uh, our purpose is to deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity, to deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity. Our strategy, our action plan is to bring our services to our clients thinking about 360 degree value. So thinking about that promise. So upskilling, bringing diverse teams, partnering around sustainability, in addition to delivering business value uh, and, and what our clients come to us and thinking of those holistically. And finally, our brand is let there be change. And that is a brand that I think in this environment is particularly important because it's meant to inspire us to all change for the benefit of all uh, and to embrace change and the power to make it for the benefit of all. And so it's a really exciting moment in, you know, as we think about navigating our new reality to also infuse in it what we all care about so much is that we all as a countries as well as companies build a better tomorrow. Why do you think people are so fearful of change and especially talk to kind of those mid-level managers and maybe small business owners who struggle with change and embracing that it may take them someplace scary, someplace different. You know, and Christy, I think you describe it, you know, well, that change can often be, um, can be scary. And a, a lot of the change that's happening is requiring us as individuals to learn very new skills, particularly digital literacy. And one of the things that we think is really important is that as much as we're investing in technology is that we invest in our people. This was a decision we made back in 2014 when we were going to rotate our business to digital cloud and security. And we said, we're going to make a bet on our people. And we invest, you know, $800 million a year in training of our people. And that's not all, it's not always possible uh, for all sizes of businesses. And so really being thoughtful about how do you bring your people along and what kinds of skills can you invest in and how do you partner? That's why we have our strategy of 360 degree value. How do you pick partners that can help that training? And the more you're transparent and then help 
um, employees see what they have to learn and that you're behind them, uh, the, the faster you'll be able to help people embrace change. And one of our leadership qualities that we look for is the courage to change and the ability to bring people along the journey. And I think as leaders, we need to make sure that we're developing and uh, leaders who have uh, that quality. Let's talk a little bit about an announcement um, you just made with MIT. Um, it's a five-year initiative to help transform um, global business as the speed of the tech world continues. Tell us about that. Yeah, really excited about this announcement. We've had a long-term relationship with MIT, which is just an outstanding um, educational institution. And this is really kind of going to uh, the next level. And it has a lot of the themes we've talked about, which is a speed. And so we recognize that companies and countries uh, are trying to move much faster. And so a part of our relationship is to do more research together about the convergence of industry around digital and technology. It's also about investing in learning and inclusion and diversity. And so we're funding fellowships for uh, diverse uh, young men and women who can be part of our future and you know, continuing to both progress inclusion and diversity, but more importantly, bring the innovation that comes from having more uh, diverse graduate students. Uh, and then and then the educational component, which is that we will be doing both for CEOs and um, broader audiences, joint training to help people learn much faster what's happening in the world and how they can move quickly in a very um, a very applied way. And so the 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 power of, of moving across MIT with all of its disciplines and pairing it with Accenture in order to help more people draw, uh, make change faster is really exciting. And, and we're just so um, grateful for the partnership. You know, you talk about diversifying the workforce and this next generation of um, employees that will be coming up and, and going through college and grad school. I'm curious, what would you tell or what would you advise young students to be studying these days? Because we always talk to our kids about, well, the job you might have may not even exist until five years from now. What would your um, advice be to people who are who are students who are going into to higher ed, what they should be looking at? Well, I will tell you that I have two daughters. They are 12 and 14 in seventh and eighth grade. And oh, you're in the middle school years, Julie. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yes, I <laughs> this. Uh, every other day, I'm like, don't you think you should study technology? And every other day, my, parent, my daughters say, absolutely not. Yep. So, uh, it's uh, really, really frustrating. But um, look, so first of all, Regardless of your passion and discipline, it is absolutely critical that you understand technology. And that's what I keep telling my children, which is to say, I don't care if you love the arts or you love this or this, that technology is a part of every discipline. And, and so I think it's really important to get a core foundation, whatever the discipline, because at the end of the day, as my daughter tells me, mom, <laughs> me to be passionate about my work. So you need to be passionate about your work, mm -hmm. but there are core capabilities, including understanding technology. And then the other piece is be a great learner. And that will not end when you graduate. And so embracing that and what does that mean uh, is, uh, is really important that as you think about your educational uh, trajectory. I'm going to have you come over and talk to my 11-year-old and 16-year-old daughters, Julie, when you have a spare moment about... Uh... Their, their career trajectory as well. Um, you know, I want to end up with this. Um, congratulations on being ranked the number one on Fortune Magazine's list of most powerful women in 2020. Um, it was interesting. They, they asked a question in making their choice saying, is she using her influence to shape her company and the wider world for the better? Which I thought was an interesting question. I wanted to know what you thought about that criteria for judging. And you were number one on the list. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, I want to really acknowledge my team because um, my ranking is really a reflection of what my, my team and our 500,000 people of Accenture have done. And I think it's a great criteria. And it goes right back to what I said earlier about how when I first became CEO, my first action was to say we needed to reconnect with what is our purpose before we did our strategy, before we did our brand because that is who we are and the impact we need to make. 
And uh, the great news is that that's a topic across you know, the, the corporate landscape in every country I go to is this understanding that as companies, we have purposes. Those purposes are for certainly our shareholders, but for all of our stakeholders. We call that shared success. And that's our goal is to be a company that believes in shared success, both internally, but also externally. And so, um, you know, Fortune has done a great job of spotlighting the need for uh, uh, people to and companies and leaders to think about, you know, all of their stakeholders. And so I thought it was fantastic that they added that to the criteria this year. Well, congratulations. And uh, Julie Sweet, the CEO of Accenture, thank you so much for the time. And really, um, I think an impactful conversation um, for leaders across the board, um, whether they're at a small company, whether they're in mid-level management and thinking about trying to accelerate their skills or push themselves to the next level, and really kind of giving us this, this global view of, of where we're all headed. We appreciate your time. Great. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed the discussion. Okay, and I want to say thanks to everyone watching out there and thanks so much to the Detroit Regional Chamber for continuing these conversations with the Mackinac Policy Conference 2020. We couldn't be there in person, but these engaging conversations online are even better than that. So we hope to see you very much soon. I'm Christy McDonald. Take care. We'll see you next time. The Detroit Regional Chamber's MPC 20 Conversations Respond and Rebuild Digital Series is provided in partnership with Detroit Public Television and presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan with additional support from Accenture, Bank of America, Barton Mallow, Comerica Bank, Consumers Energy, Delta Dental, Dow, DTE Energy, Enbridge Energy, Ford Motor Company, Huntington Bank, ITC, KPMG, the Kresge Foundation, Kroger, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, PNC Bank, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the Skillman Foundation, and TCF Bank. And by these supporters. Support for Detroit Public TV's coverage is provided by DTE Energy Foundation and MASCO.